Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. Also heard on the radio in Las Vegas. So hello to our Las Vegas audience on KDON 101.5 FM and the Bet Las Vegas 98.5 HD2. Thanks for being with us there in Las Vegas. Of course, Las Vegas just had another implosion. The Tropicana gives way to build the A's new ballpark. That'll be a subject we'll talk about, even though it's not football related some other time. But thanks for being back with us. Also, hearty hello to our video audience. And of course, our video always brought to you by our good friends at BetUS. Don't forget, you can get 150% sign up bonus on your first deposit up to $2,000. And then your second and third deposit, guess what? They're going to give you 125%. So go do that. Just use the code YouTube. 150 tell them mo and scott sent you and you will get that so thanks to them for sponsoring the video scott Colbranson back with my partner mo moten mo's the senior nfl writer at bleacher report also raiders columnist at sportsnot.com where you can catch my work you can also catch mo during the week and i think this week it's on friday right mo on uh tnt sports on true tv talking nfl that's correct All right, so make sure you tune in and see Mo and his shiny smile there. Uh, You can also follow him on x.com at Momoton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N, at LV Gully is mine. The show is SNB today. Okay, Mo, uh, bad news for the Raiders. And, man, the, the injuries keep piling up for this team, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Christian Wilkins going in on IR due to his foot injury, sustained during a sack celebration, I think, although... I find that hard to believe. I think maybe it was exacerbated. Maybe it happened before. Who knows? But anyway, he's going to go on IR. We don't know if it's going to be the four-game IR, if it's going to be longer. But uh, this team getting set to host a really big game, in my view, against the Steelers at home in Las Vegas this weekend, um, now are without Christian Wilkins. Christian Wilkins was doing a great job on the interior of that defense. Uh, This is tough, Mo. This happens all over the NFL, but the Raiders really up against it on the defensive side of the ball. Yes, yeah, so arguably you're now without your second best defensive lineman in Christian Wilkins. He's out indefinitely with that foot injury. A Jones fracture, I believe they, they said it was. So it just another blow <laughs> to the Raiders <laughs> team as a whole. You have a quarterback question. We'll talk about that. You know, no Christian Wilkins, no run game, no Devontae Adams. <laughs> I know some fans are like, just get rid of him anyway, but the hits just keep coming, and we'll see how the Raiders respond. As you said, to a big game against the Steelers, the Steelers coming in three and two, the Raiders two and three. I guess people forget with everything going on with the Raiders that if they win this game, they'll be back to five hundred. I know yes. it sounds like a long shot, but if they somehow come out with the win in this in this football game. They're back to even Steven. So the Steelers are looking to get off the schneid and snap their two game skid. The Raiders look to get back on the right track with Antonio Pierce. We'll see what happens. I expect a low scoring game, but. Harder to stop a Steelers team with Justin Fields coming in without Christian Wilkins. Yes, and in our second segment, we're going to be bringing on our good friend Jarrett Bailey, who writes for the Sporting News and also for SB Nation. Uh, and he knows the Steelers really well. He's a Steelers guy there, too, and also the host of the um, Cover One podcast, I think it's called. I forget the name of it. I'll figure it out. Sorry, Jared. I'll get it right. I promise. Uh, it is the, sorry, Pump Fake podcast. There you Pump go. See? Yes, I make mistakes. You guys tell me all the time I make mistakes. So thank you. Appreciate that always. But yeah, it's been, you know, we've talked about things, the drama around the Raiders. So it's been so much negative, but you're right, Mo. I mean, this team can get to 500. I think a lot of tunes change if the Raiders can, can get on top of the Steelers at home. And again, it's a home game. Yes. There'll be a lot of Steeler fans. Of course, they're going to travel out in these big junkets from Pennsylvania for the game to Las Vegas. um, Like most teams do. At the same time, though, you look at those injuries on the defensive side of the ball. It's just crazy. Divine Diablo, of course. Then you have Christian Wilkins. Then you have also Malcolm Kuntz. Then you have Marcus Epps. I mean, that's a lot for a team to lose, right? I mean, you can say, well, Palomalo's come in and done a great job in Epps' absence, and maybe that's a good thing. Yes, it's true. But anytime you lose depth, especially up front, and remember, Max Crosby, he played great the other day. At the same time, he's still nursing that ankle injury. It's a high ankle injury. It takes time to heal. He's not 100%, which is crazy that he plays that well when he's not 100%. But still, you know, th- they're they're in a position now where they're going to have to have guys step up and they're really going to against this Pittsburgh uh, offense, which does really well at times. And Justin Fields, he's not all the way there yet, Mo, but he is definitely going to be a challenge for this defense and as thin as they're at. 
I thought about this coming on the podcast, and I feel like Justin Fields is going to downplay it, of course, because most plays do. But I think there's going to be a little bit of Justin Fields that's going to want to show that he is better than the player that you saw in Chicago without Lugetsi. So uh-huh. Lugetsi was the offensive coordinator in Chicago. Yes, sir. Justin Fields is the quarterback in Chicago. They were together for two years. A lot of people say, whose fault is it that the Bears offense was, uh, wasn't was wasn't playing well? Was it more Justin Fields? Was it more Luke Getze? I think there's a little more on Justin Fields to say, look, <laughs> I'm a better quarterback than you saw. It was Luke Getze's fault. Uh, Luke yes. Getze can't get on the field and, and prove otherwise. He's the play caller. But this is going to, in my opinion, this is going to be a, a defensive-led football game. It's going to be low scoring. Uh, the, the offense that makes the fewest mistakes, the fewer mistakes, is going to help its team win. And the quarterback, whoever it is for the Raiders it, or Justin Fields, is going to have to make some plays in some critical moments. Let's talk about the quarterback position because uh, as of uh, the recording of this show, we know that um, they have not decided on a quarterback. And and is that surprising to you? I mean, listen, Gardner Minshew struggled and turned over the ball. Um, but then, you know, you look at it, and and maybe this is where Antonio Pierce deserves a little more credit. Yes, he's a defensive coach. He's not an offensive guy. But when you look at even the interception that Minshew threw, which was terrible, and I'm not making any mis- any excuses, because I don't believe in the excuses. No excuses for Gardner Minshew, Mo. But the more I watched that play, I don't know, 50 or 60 times. I really did terrible play design. You have three receivers all in the same area. So this goes back to scheme. So I think when you look at the tr- the troubles the Raiders have had on offense, and I know Luke Getzey's an easy uh, uh, tackling dummy right now because of how bad the offense has been, but the play design is what concerns me because when you're looking at the scheme, and yes, Gardner Minshew throws a pass, he should have hit he should have hit Brock Bowers easily with no problem, and he sails it, and it gets intercepted by Pat Satan, who takes it all the way home. But you look at that play design, Mo, and that's not the first play. It's not the only play in that game where you saw the design, and you're thinking, what's going on here? These are two criticisms that we've heard going back to the offseason that Lou Getty's play design a lot of times has multiple pass catches in one area. But I brought this up in my Bleach Report Live that Gardner Minshew has an issue hitting his first or second read on a lot of these <laughs> passes. And that's why he holds on to the ball too long and creates his own pressure. Mm. So even with the poor play design, if if Gardner Minshew just sees Brock Bowers tricking open to the end zone, we're not even talking about the play design. We're talking about the touchdown. We're probably talking about the Raiders going up 17-3 and winning that football game. But that play changed the momentum of the game. I don't like the, the thought that one play lost it for the Raiders. No. How, you know, what does it say about your football team if you make a mistake early, that early in the game, and you cannot rebound from that two, three quarters later? Right. So, I mean, this is why Gardner Minshew, by the way, is probably going to lose his job as of recording the show. No official decision has been made. But I said this on Twitter, Scott, that the first time they benched Gardner Minshew at the end of the Carolina Panthers game was a warning. The second time they do it, he's probably going to get replaced. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think it's the right move. Like, listen, there's a lot of folks out there that I hear from that somehow think that this offense is going to suddenly be 100 times better with Aiden O'Connell there. Will Aiden O'Connell come out and do what he does? Yes. Will it be better? We'll see. I don't know. Because as you mentioned, there's there's issues here with this offense with quarterback play. Gardner Minshew, to your point, looking off his first read, not hitting the player he should play, creating his own pressure. All that stuff is absolutely correct. And then you have the play design, and then you have the scheming, and then you have the timing. So there's a lot of issues here. So just because Aiden O'Connell will be a fresh start for the Raiders, so to speak, at, at uh, quarterback, and the fact that he's got some, I think, attributes that Gardner Minshew doesn't have, does not mean that they will find success instantly. So I I, I want to caution people out there because I don't think there's a magic bullet here. As J- the great John Madden, the Raiders' great coach, said, if you have two quarterbacks, you have none. And so I think this situation is not going to resolve. And I think most fans out there, Mo, have come to the conclusion and understand how important this problem that the organization has to solve as far as the quarterback position um, is, is on the priority list for this team, yet – it's not going to be solved, so you have to go, I think, to the younger guy, give him a chance um, this season to see what happens. But I also think, as you said and as we said on this show during the offseason, you're going to see these guys start multiple games multiple times. 
<laughs> we both said it too. He said, look, they're, they're going to start both quarterbacks in multiple games, as you just said. And while I think they're going to go to Aiden O'Connell for a stretch, five or six games, like they gave Gordon Minshew the first five games, I will say that if they're going to have Aiden O'Connell out there, the offensive line has to play a lot better. Mm-hmm. Because Aiden O'Connell is going to take a ton of sacks behind the way that offensive line is pass blocking right now. Aiden O'Connell is going to take a handful of sacks. And he's not quite a statue back there on the center. He can move a little bit because we, we see mm-hmm. it here and there. But he, it's not enough where he can outrun defenders with consistency or improvise with, with consistency. And if he's under duress for a lot of the time, he's under center as he was against that Denver Broncos defense, then that offense is not going to look that much better with Aiden O'Connell. He'll be more accurate. He'll get the ball out quicker than Gardner Minshew does in a lot of cases. But he won't be able to be in the pocket and allow time for the big plays to develop downfield because he'll be throwing short passes, dump offs, and screens uh, to negate the pass rush of the team and the poor pass blocking of his own offensive line. Yeah, and Mo, you talked about this before the season started too, when we were when we were still unsure who would be the starting quarterback before Minshew was tabbed as the starter at least the beginning of the season. And that was for Aiden O'Connell to be, I think, as successful as he can be uh, and his talent allows him to be, you need to have a good running game. The Raiders have had trouble with that clearly this year. That starts up front with the offensive line. We saw with Zamir White. We saw Alexander Madison have some success here and there. But if, if O'Connell is the guy, at least for the time being, moving forward at starting quarterback, um, it, it's a double pressure, right? They not only have to get better with pass blocking, but they got to get better with run blocking. So if you remember last year when Aiden O'Connell took over in week nine, I believe his first start, well, his second start was with the Giants because he did start against the Chargers in week four. He had Devontae Adams, so he had a go-to wide receiver, and he had a run game, first with Josh Jacobs, and after Josh Jacobs went down, Zamir White played well with the run game. Antonio Pierce basically gave that offense, or when he took over, that offense took on an identity. We're going to be physical. We're going to run the football. We can also take shots downfield with our receiving crew. They don't have either of those things now. I know right. you got Brock Bowers in there, but no Devontae Adams. I know people, I know fans don't want to hear about Devontae Adams because it's a trade request, but let's be honest, Devontae is still a, a quality football player, even though he does have some drops. Still a quality football player. And you don't have that complimentary run game anymore. The Raiders are 30th third fewest rushing yards through five weeks. Mm. So he doesn't have the run game to lean on now. He has one He has one fewer receiver he can rely on in, in go-to moments. You know, it's not going to be the same offensive operation he took over last year. So you can't, again, you can't expect the same results he got last year without a complimentary run game and a go-to wide receiver. It's going to look very different. So he's going to have to do more with less in a, in a sense. Right. And the Raiders offense doesn't, in the totality of it, the Raiders offense doesn't have an identity right now. So is he going to take over and give this offense an identity? I highly doubt it. And the, one of the pros is that he'll be more accurate. He won't lose the Raiders games by throwing pick sixes in a red zone as much as their Carter Minshew did. He won't <laughs> turn the ball over as much. But the Raiders are going to need to score points. And how are they going to do that when their offense is still in disarray? Yeah, and and this weekend will be a tough challenge too because the the Steelers the Steelers defense is struggling on third down, which is good for the Raiders. But other than that, though, it's it's still one of the best defenses in the league. You're seeing what they're doing. So if he does get the start uh, on Sunday, then guess what? He's going up against a stout defense, and it's going to present challenges for the Raiders up front. And I think you got yes, Brock Bowers. I think listen, this is a well coached team in Pittsburgh. You're going to see them uh, bracket and try to take away Brock Bowers, which means you're going to have to have Jacoby Myers, I think, on the outside, really step up and be a guy for Aiden O'Connell. Yes, you got Trey Tucker in the slot and some other the other guys out there. But to me, somebody's got to emerge as a playmaker in this offense in the passing game uh, other than Brock Bowers, because Brock Bowers will get his targets. And I think it's a, it'd be great for him, especially on the checkdowns or the short passes, which they did a good job with at the beginning of the game last week. But for Aiden O'Connell, he's also go, he can throw the ball downfield. So you're going to have to have some of that outside threat. And to me, Jacoby Myers is the only guy, uh, unless you got somebody else you think might step up, Mo. I think that's the guy who's going to have to pick up the slack with Devontae Adams gone and, and the fact that they're going to have a quarterback who can challenge a little more down the field. Kobe Myers is going to make some plays. He was a number one wide receiver with the New England Patriots for a stretch. 
So he'll have he'll put up he'll post numbers. Mm -hmm. The problem is if they start to key on a Jacoby Myers with, with a cornerback and a safety, you know, what is Aiden O'Connell's second option? And can he rely on that second option consistently down to down? I would think it's gonna be uh Trey Tucker. I'm not, I'm excluding Brock Bowers because he's a tight yeah. end, but just saying among the wide receiver options that Aiden O'Connell is gonna have, if not Jacoby Myers or Brock Bowers. Who else can uh can be relied upon in, on third down? You mm -hmm. know, if you have a third and long situation, if you need a guy to win one on one, because that's what it comes down to. And there was a point made on Twitter that I just want to bring to light, and a lot of people like, don't want to talk about Devontae Adams, but he draws coverage, he draws yes. attention, he draws the attention of the safeties, and that helps a lot of other guys get open on the field. And when you don't have that then it makes it a lot tougher on your wide receiver two, your wide receiver three, your your pass catching tight end to make some plays. And, oh, by the way, Michael Mayer is still away from the team. I think that if the Raiders had Michael Mayer in there and they can run those two tight end sets with two pass catching tight ends, yes. it will make things a lot easier on Aiden O'Connell as well. But now without him is, you know, dealing with personal issues, now you're in a bind and now you're relying on Trey Tucker to take a – a significant leap now you're relying on dj turner and tyreek McAllister to be more involved now you're relying on brock Bowers, who by the way we think he's going to be great but he's still a rookie he's only played five games <laughs> so we we can't expect him to be an all pro tight end right out of the box he's going to make mistakes he's going to have drops you saw a drop early in, in the previous game uh he's going to have those moments so you have Aiden o'connell Still relatively inexperienced. You have Brock Bowers, relatively inexperienced. You have an experienced wide receiver, Jacoby Myers. We'll see what we get without a run game. It's hard to get the passing game going when you're one-dimensional against any football team, let alone a team with a good defense like the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, and I think I think the Raiders are in a tough position here, Mo, because you can't, you know, there's there's not a lot you can do at this point to mix it up, right? You don't have some player that's on the roster that just needs a chance. And so the Raiders are going to have to just, I think, slug their way through this. There's no other way to, to say it. And uh, so you, you have to, I think, temper your expectations. I have with them. I just like to see improvement. That's where we talk about coaching. We talk about progress. It doesn't always mean wins wins on the, on the wins and losses column. You might have more losses than wins. But at the same time, you want to see things get better. You want to see the offense run more efficiently. You want to see defensively them do things now. They're they're way thin on defense. And even before they were as thin as they are now, they were struggling on defense, which was has been a big surprise so far this year. So so we'll see. And, and again, they got a big challenge coming up against the Steelers on Sunday down at Allegiant Stadium. We're going to step aside for our first break. When we come back, Jarrett Bailey from the Sporting News and from uh, SB Nation will join us where he's going to tell us What's going on with these Pittsburgh Steelers? And we'll preview that game coming up next here on Silver and Black Today. Again, brought to you by Video Wise, our good friends at BetUS. And again, listening to us uh, on the Odyssey Sports Podcast Network and on 101.5 FM, KDON in Las Vegas, as well as 98.5 The Bet. We're coming back. It's Mo and Scott, Silver and Black Today. Don't go anywhere. Hey everybody, it is Scott, and you know Mo and I talk about it on the show all the time, and that's putting a little bit of dough on the games. Not only the Raider games, but NFL games. We also like to bet some baseball, a little bit of everything. And to do that, we go to our partners at BetUS. If you haven't bet yet with BetUS, you're missing out. Not only do they have a great world-class website to make those bets, mobile app as well, no matter where you're at, even for our fans in Nevada, you can do it there. But the most important thing is they really take good care of you. Talking about customer service, you know, so many times today it's lost on companies, especially in this growing field of online gambling. But if you look at BetUS, not only do they have great payouts, great odds, and pretty much everything you want to bet on, but they take care of you. You can, in fact, get a personal betting analyst to, to work with, an assistant to work with, your own personal assistant. They will assign you a person that you can reach out to and they'll help you with it. So that's what you want to do. But I'm up here on the website just to show you how easy it is. And of course, I'm wearing my Padres stuff because the Padres are in the playoffs. But we look at football and I'll tell you what, you go through this website, you're able to see every game in the NFL. And this is what we do. You know, on our Thursday shows, you guys hear us do it, but you can get here, you can get the odds. Not only that, but you can also go into the tab here. It's 
works as markets and you can bet uh, everything from the game, the halves to quarters to game props uh, and and be able to really make the Sunday fun. Outside of the Raiders, we know uh, you're, you're ride or die with them and it's emotional. So I don't necessarily think you should bet on them. But nonetheless, you got to bet on something. You got to have some fun. And at BetUSA to do it. Not only that, the amazing thing about this too is guess what they do? Guess what? Because Mo and I went to bat for you guys. Yes, we went to bat for you. The BetUS will give you 150% signing bonus, sign up bonus uh, on your first deposit up to $2,000. That's right, you heard it, 150. So you put 100 bucks down, you're getting 150 bucks. And you also can deposit your second or third time, $125, uh, 125% bonus is basically what it is. So you put 100, you get 125. That's your next two deposits, deposits two and three, up to $2,000 as well. And all you got to do is use our special code here. It is YouTube150. Again, that is YouTube150 to get your 150% sign-up bonus. This is an exclusive offer here on Silver and Black today from our boys, our girls over at BetUS where the game begins. And again, they will take care of you. They take care of us. You know, we don't just do ads and have partners on the show to do it. We do it with only people that we believe in that we would use. I'm not going to ever try to turn you on to a product I wouldn't use, and BetUS does that. But go do it. Check it out. You can bet anything you want from basketball, football, ice hockey, even politics. Look at this. I know we're talking about football, but if I want to bet on the U.S. politics, I go here and check this out. I think I can bet. Look, I can bet on the presidential election. Right there, the updated odds, Kamala Harris at minus 120, Donald Trump at minus 10. They don't have a point spread. <laughs> Get it? But anyway, you could bet on politics. I know that's a dicey situation to talk about, but all these type things, great parlays, you name it. Again, got to remind you, using this special code from us here at Silver and Black today from our friends at BetUS, YouTube 150, 150% sign-up bonus on your first deposit up to two thousand dollars and 125 on the next two deposits up to two thousand dollars as well again youtube 150 from bet us the official sports book of silver and black today go get them welcome back silver and black today aussie sports original podcast also hearty hello to our audience in las vegas on the radio they're listening on 101.5 kdon and also 98.5 the bet in Las Vegas. So thank you to that. Also video brought to you by our good friends at bet us who I made a little wealthier this past weekend with my picks. <clears throat> Not good. Anyway, we are back. We're talking Raiders versus Steelers. Uh, Scott Brands and Mo Moten back with you. And also joining us now is Jarrett Bailey. Jarrett uh, writes about the NFL for the sporting news. Also SB nation. You can catch his podcast, which is also good fun. The pump fake podcast. Uh, as well, wherever you get your audio. And when we want to talk Steelers, we got to go to Jarrett. I mean, uh, Jarrett, let's uh, jump in right away on this one. Listen, the the, the Steelers uh, uh, have Russell Wilson back at practice this week. And there seems to be this chatter about some people. I see some Steeler fans that want to go to Russell Wilson. And I'm looking at what the job that Justin Fields has done and how he's kind of redeemed himself with finally some good coaching in Pittsburgh. Uh, I don't understand it. What's the latest there? What's going on with the quarterback situation as they head to Las Vegas to face the Raiders? Yeah, it's just Steelers fans being impulsive and like res respectfully being stupid. Like <laughs> Justin Fields has been perfectly fine at quarterback thus far. Um, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, how is this different from Kenny Pickett from a year ago? Here's a big fat for instance on how it's different from Kenny Pickett from a year ago. So throughout the first five games, Justin Fields so far, Eight total touchdowns, 15th in EPA, 15th in success rate, 6th in CPOE, 13th in EPA plus CPOE. Those are perfectly fine quarterback numbers. He's quite literally a slightly above middle of the pack quarterback. He's played well. Mm -hmm. Kenny Pickett through five games last year, five touchdowns, 29th in EPA, 32nd in success rate, 31st in CPOE, 33rd in EPA plus CPOE. So everybody's freaking out about the offense and whatnot and you know the lack of points, but the difference between the Steelers offense this year, at least the biggest one in my eyes and uh, of previous years is that they can't run the ball. Like mm -hmm. they, if you look at the yardage and whatnot, uh, they're I think like 11th in the NFL right now in rushing yards, but it's very much a volume stat for them. Uh, they haven't had a game where Najee Harris 
has you know had over four yards of carry. They haven't averaged four yards a carry as a team yet so far this year. They're twenty seventh in rush success rate last time I checked. So they can't run the ball. Um, Justin Fields' top targets against Dallas were Van Jefferson and Connor Hayward because uh, George Pickens was very clearly being benched or punished for whatever reason. And that's another element that they have to worry about now is George Pickens you know, potentially going off the deep end. So Justin Fields has been fine. He's dealt with several offensive line injuries as well. They've lost Troy Fatani for the year. They've lost James Daniels for the year. Isaac Samala missed the first four games. So everything that has been thrown at him, he's played well. Even against Dallas, like Dallas was probably his worst game as a Steeler, and it was still like a fine performance. He threw two touchdowns. Um, and it was probably like a C, C minus performance. So it's not like he's played horrible. Um, I think that everybody freaking out and saying, oh, start Ru- Russell Wilson. I think they're a little <laughs> bit out of their mind at the moment. So you threw out a lot of things there, Jerry. You talked about the offensive line injuries, the Steelers physical identity on the offensive side of the ball, which I'm used to. Not seeing it with the run game. Najee Harris, not explosive. You talked about George Pickens. What is the identity of the Steelers offense? What do you think the identity is going to be of the Steelers offense coming into this Raider game? Are they going to continue to try to run the football? Are they going to get, are they going to let George Pickens out of the doghouse? What happens with this offense? Yeah, I think I know what I want, what they want their identity to be. And that's, you know, a team that, you know, can run it on early down, set up second and short, and the play action pass, which, They've tried a lot of the play action pass. Um, and throughout the first couple of weeks, it was working. Justin Fields was one of the best play action passers in football throughout you know, weeks one and two. Um, but they just haven't been able to run the ball successfully uh, over the past three weeks, really, um, to be able to set up any sort of consistent play action pass. So um, against a Raiders team where I'm trying to look up what they rank right now in terms of rushing success rate and things of that nature just to kind of get a feel because they faced the Cowboys last week who were dead last in EPA per rush defensively, and they still couldn't do anything. The Raiders are 28th right now. So <laughs> um, if you can't run against Dallas, I'm not going to believe you can run against anybody until you show me you can. Um, with And with Najee Harris, like, and I tweeted this too, it was like every Najee Harris run is the most chaotic two-yard gain I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Like, <laughs> Harris just, I, I think it's just okay to say that Najee, Najee Harris just isn't very good. Um, so, and they've been without Jalen Warren. They've been without Cordero Patterson because both of them are dealing with injuries. They're going to probably be without both of them again this week. So that means it's going to be the rookie out of Harvard, Aaron Shamplin, and then the UFL signing Jonathan Ward that are going to be back at Najee. So uh, I don't expect much from the run game. I think it's going to be the same Steelers game that I've seen probably around four times so far this year. Um, which it's a game that they can win uh, if the defense plays as well as it did in, in the first three weeks. But the last couple of weeks, the defense has been uh, quite disappointing. So they need to get more from their defense and hopefully against a Raiders team who whoever starts at quarterback. Have, have they announced who's starting yet, by the way, because they pulled Gardner last week. I don't know what's going on there. Devontae Adams isn't playing. That'll help out the defense hopefully a little bit. But they need to be more complimentary on, on either side of the ball. Yeah, I think they might be pulling a vendor from the stands at Allegiant Stadium to, to start. I don't know. We, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, but, Jarrett, you talked about the defense and the last couple of weeks, things kind of getting uh, out of control for them. Uh, we've heard TJ Watt talk about communications issues. We've seen them really struggle on third down, especially. What's going on on that defense? What do they have to do to get this thing right? So the third down defense is a big issue. Um Patrick Queen continues to be somewhat of a disappointment through five games. And I think it's okay at this point to be like, okay, yeah, something's up with Patrick Queen because the constant miscommunications, there was a play against Dallas where Jace Ferguson is like standing and there's not a Steeler within the same County uh, as him. And, uh, you know, that comes back to, all right, Patrick Queen, you got the green dot, man. And that's probably your assignment there in the flat. Um, so like stuff like that has just been happening weekly with, with Queen and, I mean, they're dealing with injuries on that side of the ball, too. Alex Highsmith got hurt. Um, Nick Herbig got hurt against Dallas. He's not going to play against against Vegas. Neither is Highsmith. So they're going to be, you know, they're, the, the Raiders are going to be able to key in on T.J. Watt because they're not going to have really any viable other edge rusher. It's going to be, I think, Jeremiah Moon is going to be mm-hmm. the probable starter opposite of him. So um, 
yeah, defensively, it's been a lot of, you know, the first three weeks they were great. Didn't allow more than 10 points. And then week four rolls around. The first play from scrimmage is a 42-yard completion of Michael Pittman. And that kind of set the tone for the day. Um, and then against Dallas, like, yeah, they had three takeaways. They blocked a field goal. And, you know, those are great. But they also allowed two drives of 15 plays or more that ended in touchdowns. So when you're the highest paid defensive unit in football, like you can't do that. Like, I don't care what the score is. Like, if that's the style of ball that Mike Tomlin wants to play, which is outdated and can't win you big games, hey, then you get the defense has to be that good. So, yeah, last two weeks haven't been great. Hopefully they can uh, clean up some stuff this week. So, Jared, let's get away from the field and the X's and O's and the stats for a minute. All right, so I'm going to ask you an important question here, and I'm hoping to get a good answer from this one. <laughs> You're the Steelers GM. Is there any way possible that I can convince you to toss the Raiders a second round pick? <laughs> yes. <laughs> for Devontae Adams? Yes, absolutely. Here's the thing, man. So many fans and so many people are like, oh, you can't give up a second round pick. Why? What are you going to take in the second round that's going to be as good right now as Devontae Adams? Nothing. People put way too much value into draft picks. It's it's the family guy mystery box thing. It's like, oh, a boat's <laughs> a boat, but a mystery box could be anything. It could even be a boat. Like, dude, then just trade the second round pick and get Devontae Adams. So, yeah, dude, you wouldn't have to talk me in any. Now, the Raiders would have to eat a decent amount of that money for a second round pick. But if if they could come to, you know, to terms and be like, all right, now we'll eat X amount of dollars if you give us a two, then, yeah. Say la vie, I'd give it to you. And uh, if, if Devontae Adams is wearing 17 in black and gold, I'm chilling. Take the second round pick. I don't care. Yeah, it, it it makes a lot of sense there, too. And I think that that leadership as well. I mean, with, with Justin Fields, a quarterback, I mean, he's had some years now. He's he's not a rookie, per se, but he is kind of reemerging. Uh, and that offense, I think, could use that spark. And listen, Devontae Adams, OK, yeah, he's going to be 32 years old, but he's got a few years left in him. And to me, that window for the Steelers and where they're at, it makes perfect sense on that level, too, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And, you know, if they do end up, I mean, there's a lot of like murmurs that they might like trade George Pickens at some point, which I think that there might be actually some levity to. Mm -hmm. um, but if things do work out with Pickens and then you still have Devontae Adams and if you want to draft a guy in the first or second round next year to give you like a nice collection of guys that allows Devontae Adams to age gracefully into like a wide receiver two or three, you know, over the next couple of years. So, yeah, again. You don't have to convince me whatsoever to trade a second round pick for Devontae Adams. Like, again, people get way too emotionally attached to draft capital for some reason. And I, I wish more team, I wish the Steelers, especially, would just take the like less sneed approach and just F them picks. Give me guys that I know are good. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully something comes to uh, fruition uh, on that side of things in the next few days because. You know, obviously we spent months and months. Oh, maybe Brandon Ayuk will be a Steeler. And then it just ended up he stayed in San Francisco. So hopefully, you know, for my sake, I don't know how you guys feel about everything. But hopefully for my sake, Devontae Adams remain, or comes to Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, if they get a good haul in return for him, then good for him. Yeah, look, Jared, I'm all for it if the Reds can get a second round pick. Because right now they're saying that the best they could do is a third rounder because of his age and his contract. But I think if you're a Steelers team and you're really trying to go for it and get to the back yeah. to the playoffs and win some games, what do you are you really going to miss that? So as you said, what can you get exactly. that's, gonna that's gonna be better right now to help you right now? That, so that's, I, that's my biggest thing too. It's just like what where are the holes on this team that you like, oh man, we cannot part with a second round pick. Like the biggest holes that they have right now are, you know, if if one of these guys doesn't prove to be a franchise quarterback, and you're probably not taking one of those in the second round anyway. So uh, I'm not, again, a second round pick isn't going to break my heart if it turns into Devontae Adams, man, because nothing that they take in the second is going to be as good as him. Well, what, and, and, one other thing. Oh, go ahead. What, go ahead. Quick, Mike. Sorry, Scott. One other yeah. thing. The running joke out there, though, uh, Jared, is why is it that the Steelers draft these wide receivers who <laughs> tweak out in Pittsburgh and then they go and then the Raiders want to go pick them up from Pittsburgh and bring them? <laughs> To Oakland slash Las Vegas. So I, I understand what, you, what you're saying about George Pickens. And I have him on my fantasy team. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I don't want any parts of George Pickens if he's going through some things out there in Pittsburgh. We went through this with Antonio Brown, Martavis Bryant. We yeah. don't need a third experimental wide receiver having a reclamation project with the Raiders. You don't want to complete the uh, the Steelers. No, effect no that. But linebacker worked out with Spillane. So, you know, hey, if oh, it's Cheddar that, Bob, man. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love Cheddar Bob Spillane. Yeah, I'm happy that things are working out for him. Uh, it's, and in terms of Pickens, man, like 
I'm not going to pretend like I have anything like known or confirmed about this, but if you want to read the tea leaves a little bit, uh, if you go back uh, after the game against New England last year where they lose, Pickens like threw a fit in the end zone because he didn't get a ball thrown to him. And after the game, Minka Fitzpatrick was talking. He's like, yeah, we got guys that just want to show up and think that they're going to make plays. They don't want to work for it. And we have to check that mentality. It doesn't really take a rocket scientist to try to figure <laughs> out who he was talking about. And then after the, the Dallas game this past week, Pat Fryermuth, uh, you know, was asked about um, the targets and whatnot. He's like, yeah, you know, guys will, you know, bitch and moan about targets and everything, but it's what you do when you don't get the ball. And it's like, dude, you can't make it any more obvious who you're talking about right now. <laughs> like, we, we, so, yeah. And the fact that he only had 34 snaps, which is a career low, Mike Tomlin attributed it to snap management, and everybody's like, oh, okay, Mike, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so it's very clear that they were punishing him for something. Um, if they don't think that he's going to ever mature, maybe they do move him. I don't know. Yeah. But th there's definitely something there that's, that's going on. Yeah, and the Adams thing, too, the last thing on this I'll just say is that it makes more sense for him to go to the Steelers because – the Jets aren't going anywhere, and the Saints aren't going anywhere. So if you're Devontae Adams and you want to win somewhere, where's your best chance of winning? Apparently, Kansas City would like him, but they're not going to trade with the Chiefs in the division. Right. So so to me, Pittsburgh seems like the destination. So eat some of the money, get it, at, get what you can from them, and move on. So we'll see how it all works out. Well, it'll be, it'll I'll, be I'll interesting. Throw, I'll throw this team out there, too. I mean, if I'm Devontae Adams, I would love to go play with Terry McLaurin and Jaden Daniels. Oh, um, yeah. I think that that would be a fun – they were in on Brandon Ayuk. I think that – Outside of McLaurin, I mean, it was, you know, Diami Brown, Noah Brown, Luke McCaffrey. I think that if you had Devontae Adams on the outside, yeah, sign me up to watch that. If it's not Pittsburgh, that would be my preferred place just to be able to watch that. That would be fun. Oh, yeah. It'd be fun out there. All right. There's Jared Bailey talking Steelers with us. We appreciate it. You can catch Jared on X at J Bailey NFL. Also read his stuff up on Sporting News and also SB Nation and the Pump Fake Podcast. Jared, as always, my man, pleasure. We appreciate you being with us. Appreciate you, boys. All right, we're going to check out for just a minute here when we come back on Silver and Black today. We're going to get to your phone calls on the Raider Nation mailbag. Again, video brought to you by our friends at BetUS. We'll be back right after this. Enough of hearing us talk about the Raiders. It's time to hear from you. Any Oakland Raider fan, Las Vegas Raider fan, stand up. On this edition of the Raider Nation Mailbag. Got that, got that black hole rock and rolling. Don't be a wallflower. Be a part of the show. Leave your question or message by calling 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. All right. Welcome back. Silver and Black Today. Odyssey Sports Original Podcast. Also heard on 101.5 FM KDON in Las Vegas, as well as 98.5 the bet on HD2 and video brought to you by our good friends at Bet US. All right, Mo, you ready to jump into this? Now we had a bunch of calls from Sunday, which you can imagine how those were. We if you called in on Sunday, we're not going to get to those calls. And, and my apologies, but we had a loss in our family, and so we didn't do a Tuesday show. And so I'm just skipping ahead to the more recent calls, but keep calling in. We're just getting so many now that uh you know we'll, we'll, we'll go into overtime and do more segments if we have calls but uh if it's going to be four hours worth of calls it's really tough to do but anyway keep calling in just because you don't get on this show doesn't mean you won't get on the next one we will get to your calls so we appreciate that and the support it means everything to us so all good stuff all right mo you ready to take these these should be all interesting we're starting off with our good friend gary harkin reader now second time he's called in gary usually emailed us last year especially good stuff and Gary actually donated two Raiders books that he donated to me. I don't know. It might have been two years ago now, maybe even longer. We, I was going to do, I was going to put those up this week because we're going to auction those off uh, to bidders. And uh, the money's going to go to, of course, the One Nation Foundation. You heard Murph talk about that on our post game shows, uh, which helps Raiders charities. We're going to take those books. These are original books uh, on Ken Stabler and a couple other things. So we're going to take those and do that uh, hopefully next week. So stick around for that. But that's Gary Harkin. He donated those books to the One Nation uh, One Nation Foundation. Blah, blah, blah. If I can spit it out. There we go. So here's Gary Harkin Reader, our good buddy. Hey, guys. It's uh, Gary Harkin Reader from the Poconos. Hey, I have uh, one word. The word is a disillusionment. <laughs> and I have four questions. Is it the players, coaches, or the scheme. Mm. Second question, 
Who stole the defense? <laughs> Third question, does Mark Davis really care? And the fourth question, is AP becoming a version of McDaniels? Hey, guys, take care. You do a great job. You know, you got your work cut out for you. Okay, <laughs> take care. Bye-bye. There's our good buddy, Gary Harker Reader, with some big questions. Um, I'll hit the first one, Mo. The, the, is it player scheme, uh, so on? Um, yes, yes, yes. I think it's a little bit of everything when you look at it from an offensive standpoint. And then he talked about what happened to the defense. I think injuries is a big part of that. But even before some of these injuries, the defense was struggling. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that one. Yeah, I remember when I talked about consistency with Patrick Graham, I said, you know, he had a good – Defense with the Giants, I believe, was top 10 in scoring, but it didn't, it wasn't able to sustain it. You can have a good defense for one year, but it's hard to, to with free agency, with changes, and you got to reinvent certain things. Uh, other, your opponents changing with their offensive schemes, it's hard to feel the a top 10 defense back to back years. And you're seeing how tough that is, especially with the injuries, as you talked about. So, a lot of that to me is just consistency. And Patrick Graham still hasn't, hasn't had that consistency year to year when it comes to fielding top tier defenses. I want to get to his question about the uh, is AP becoming another Josh McDaniels. There's a stark difference between their coaching styles in the sense that I think AP is less rigid than Josh McDaniels is or was as a head coach. Unfortunately, the similarities are in the fact that, and I think I talked about this last week, you're seeing, I, I'm not saying players are checked out, I'm not one of those people that's saying that AP has lost a locker room. But when you have guys, when you have to call out guys early in the season about making business decisions, and this isn't just about Devontae Adams. Remember, he benched Jack Jones for a quarter. Uh, when you have those type of things with a, with a team meeting this early in the season, you start to see some similarities on how the team is responding to coaching with Josh McDaniels and under Antonio Pierce. Now, again, I'm not saying they're the same in terms of coaching style. Very, very different. And Tony Pierce is way more of a motivator than Josh McDaniels is. But the results are very similar in that the one thing I'll say is that I never thought we would be talking about a Josh uh, Antonio Pierce-led team lacking effort, lacking energy, lacking the will to play hard football. Now, of course, you're going to get the Max Crosby's who are going to go full throttle on every snap. But to have these criticisms, criticisms of a uh, Antonio Pierce team lacking energy, <laughs> lack lacking lacking the the pep in their step in uh, in their first home game of the season, that was shocking to me, and it reminded me of some of what we saw with under Josh McDaniels, but not that they're the same type of head coach. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because I look at you know Antonio Pierce, and we've said it on this show, and you can go back and since this is a big term in the vernacular now, you can go back and fact check us in the summertime where we talked about Antonio Pierce and the Raiders hiring him that, that there would be some challenges and it's a learning on the job type of thing. And that's why he brought in Marvin Lewis and all that stuff. So we, we got that. And, and I think that I'm totally fine with some of the mistakes he makes. And I think those are the, those are the things that you just get. And it's like, you point them out. It's not, you're not picking on the guy. You don't like him because of the co because of the color of his skin. It's not, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with performance on the field. And when I look at it, Antonio Pierce, to me, you, you're exactly right. The surprise has been some of the other stuff, not the stuff on the field and some of those mistakes. Okay, you get over that. You learn from it. And I think he has learned in some in some cases. So I'm not worried about that piece of it. It's the other stuff. And we'll see. Players are trying to minimize it. We've heard Max Crosby a lot in the media this week minimizing it and minimizing criticisms of of the, the game that he was out and that's perfectly within his rights to do that um and it gets you a sense for what's going on in there but i do think that that is a surprise so gary good question there as well so we'll see how it all bets up but i mean look it, he, he's got the rest of the season we'll see how it all unfolds and the season can change quickly as we mentioned earlier in the show all right all right we're gonna say goodbye to our radio audience right now and we're going to go into overtime on the podcast feeds for more calls because we got more calls we're going to get to those but obviously we had an interview this show so on the radio we got to cut it a little bit shorter so do us a favor make sure you subscribe to the podcast that way you can get that extra segment with the phone calls in overtime and uh, join us there on the podcast feed wherever you get your audio don't forget to rate and review 
and subscribe wherever you get it. Again, the video brought to you today by our good friends at BetUS. Also, uh, a goodbye and enjoy the game up at Allegiant Stadium to our audience in Las Vegas on KDON as well as on The Bet in Las Vegas. For Mo Moten, I'm Scott Branson. For producer Mark Bonilla and uh, Mike Rabier, I'm Scott Branson. We'll talk to you soon and next week here on the radio. Take care, everybody. All right, welcome back to Silver and Black Today. Overtime, we're going to get to our calls here for our podcast audience and for our video audience. Of course, video brought to you by our good friends at BetUS. Okay, Mo, we, we've heard some calls. Uh, and man, I, again, every week the calls, not because I agree with them all, all the time, because sometimes I don't agree with some of the points, but man, they are so good. And we, we heard right before the end of the last segment, Dominique from St. Louis, who always calls in good stuff. So now we're going to go out. We haven't heard uh, a little bit in a while from our good friend, the infamous Jacob in Fresno. So for longtime listeners of the show, you know who he is. But here is the infamous Jacob in Fresno. Jacob. <laughs> yeah. Go, 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 kind of a thing they're just a hobby that i'm going to pay attention to every once in a while <laughs> it's just you can't you cannot keep your sanity you cannot keep your peace if you make it any more than that because you're it's supposed to be commitment to excellence it's really commitment to excrement at this point it's so horrible it's awful it's terrible it is perfunctory to the core terrible i i can't stand it i just can't stand it i i'm done I'm done, guys. And by that, I mean I'm only going to watch a little bit of the games every week. I'm only going to check out the highlights two days of the week. I'm only going to – I'm stuck. I'm stuck in the cycle. I'm stuck with the Raiders. This is it. I'm done. My life's done. It's over. The Raiders are just – they're there. They're there. I can't get rid of them. It's like a mold, and I want to go get a surgery, get it frozen off, get it burned off. I can't do it. It keeps throwing back. It's back. It's here. Why? Why did I have to choose the silver and black? Why did I have to choose the Raiders? I did. I did. I chose them when I was like 12 and now I'm stuck for life. But that's just the fact what it is, Raider Nation. You're stuck. So why are you here? Don't be a Debbie Downer. You cannot be happy about something. Let's talk about the rock. That guy's incredible. But what else is going on? A little bit of Max Crosby and that's it, right? That's it. What do we got to look forward to, guys? Give us something to look forward to. I'm just thinking, I'm thinking in my thoughts, I'm feeling, man, if we would have sent Devontae and a couple picks to the commanders, we would have gotten Jaden Daniels. This whole thing would have looked different, but we're stuck. What's the hope for the future? Give me something to hope for. Scott and Mo, come on. I need some help, man. Help Raider Nation out. What do we got to look forward to? Because it's down. We are down and we are down bad. What do we got to look forward to, Scott and Mo? You let me know. You, you help me. Get me off the ledge, guys. I need it this week. You take it easy. Go great. <laughs> Jacob getting it all off his chest, <clears throat> blow, blowing out his phone receiver in the process. I think I heard his kids <laughs> screaming at him because he's getting a little unhinged there. Hey, positives, positives, Jacob. Uh, it's it's almost the holiday season. That's joyous. It's happy. It's fun times. That's you know, your one positive, uh, Scott. That's positive, right? I mean, uh, also, in just a few weeks, we won't have to watch any more political commercials. That's awesome as well. I'm tired of political commercials. So those are some positive things for you. Also, also, Mo, uh, hey, if Aiden O'Connell gets a start, at least you get to see the kid work again. That's what I was going to say, Scott, that I think we're finally going to get to see, for all the Aiden O'Connell truthers out there, I know it's <laughs> another tough hand he's going to be dealt if he does start, assuming he does. Mm -hmm. But now we can finally, okay, see, you know, Aiden O'Connell for what we what we think is a stretch of games, and he'll have 17 or more games on his resume. We can kind of have a more full, well-rounded assessment of Aiden O'Connell 
we think he's a backup quarterback. But it, you know, if he pulls out some Aiden O'Connell magic, who knows? Never know. I doubt it. But if he shows to be a competent backup quarterback, then now you have a high end backup quarterback who has more experience and who's accurate. And then you'll draft a quarterback very high in 2025. So, so if the Raiders are as bad as, as Jacob has screamed out, they'll be. <laughs> then the Raiders will have a top five pick and you'll have a young quarterback. You'll have a high end backup. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll have Antonio Pierce back, who a lot of people still like. You'll still have Max Crosby under contract. Hopefully Christian Wilkins will come back healthy in 2025. And all of a sudden you'll be the Houston Texans of last year, the Washington Commanders of early this year, maybe. As I said with Dominique at the end of his call, it only takes one off season to turn things around. If yes. You get a lot of things right. So the Raiders, you're looking at it right now. You're assessing the season as we need answers. What is Aiden O'Connell? Mm. We're probably going to find out. Is Antonio Pierce head coaching material in, in a tough situation? We're going to find out. How many other players are going to jump ship like, it, like Devontae Adams did and say, I want out. You filter out all the guys that don't want to be there. And then you, you keep the guys that do want to be there for 2025 when you're trying to turn things around. The other thing is you would hope that you have answers on your offensive coordinator. Do the Raiders make a decision on Luke Getzey? Does he stay or does he go? I think there's going to be a lot of talk about that, a lot of discussion there. So you're hoping that they get all these questions answered, even in a tumultuous season. Absolutely. Well said. All right. Now we're going on to our buddy Anders out in Oakland. Here's Anders. Uh, hi, fellas. It's uh, Anders from Oakland. Not sure if I'll make it on the show or not. That's okay. I think one of the biggest things we've overlooked here about Minshew uh, is not that he makes some boneheaded Garoppolo-like plays, which is, you know, shit happens. Okay, that's all right. It's not all right, but it happens. But the lack of leadership is unbelievable, which is, you know, when the going gets tough, leaders step up. And they say, hey, guys, it's going to be all right. We're going to take care of this. A couple of weeks ago, it required Max Crosby to walk up to this guy and tell him things were going to be all right. Did he look at his offensive line? Did he look at his receivers? Did he look at his running backs and say, guys, I know I kind of messed up, but we're going to be okay? No. He shrunk like a violet. <laughs> this last game, he throws the interception. Okay. Yeah, we're still – we're still in the game, and the guy absolutely disappears. I think he was like 3 of 10 or something like this, just an absolutely pathetic performance. He has one bad throw, and the guy's gone. Like, you cannot have him lead this team. He is not a leader. He is, he is just out there going, to who, to who, to who. Yeah, well, that was a bummer. Bummer, you know, <laughs> and Crosby has to pump the guy up. And that's why the whole team is deflated. You cannot, in any way, one play out of, what, 60, 70 plays, and then all of a sudden you throw an interception and the game is over? That is too thin of a margin. The, the, that guy should never take the field again, ever. <laughs> because if you are going to be the quarterback, the most important position in sports, you have to be able to lead people, inspire people, have people believe in you and believe in what you're doing and this guy walks away like the intern making photocopies Oof. Yeah, pathetic jesus all right there's honors in oakland mic drop at the end there and you know what he brings up a good point mo which is yes people like Minshew. he's a free spirit the mustache the hair the outfits all that kind of crazy stuff he's he's a funny dude but on the field, he doesn't demand. This is one of the criticisms. Remember last year going back to Aiden O'Connell was he needed to be more of a vocal leader on the field as the quarterback. It was something they gave him to work on during camp. Gardner Minshew is not that guy either. And I think Anders brings that up. He does not, he doesn't command. He can go out and make plays, but he doesn't command the huddle, so to speak. And that seems to have been missing from the Raiders for quite a while now, since I, at least Derek Carr left. That's an excellent point that honors made, and I didn't even bring up that <laughs> when you're when you're a quarterback of a football team, you have to be the leader. You have to be the guy that, that pumps other guys up and say everything is going to be all right. You have to have now I know Max Crosby's been there for years. He's he's the emotional leader of that locker room. 
But when you have to have Max Crosby talk to you and say everything's going to be okay as the quarterback of the football team in a leadership position, that's mm-hmm. a red flag. And and I said I kind of said this in the first segment that how is it that you make one mistake and your offense doesn't recover for the rest of the game? <laughs> what does that say about your football team? Now, I didn't make the point that Anders just made, which is very much on point. But this team led by Gardner, this offense led by Gardner Minshew, folds like a lawn chair after one mistake. And that you, as he, as Anders pointed out, you cannot have that. The, 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 the Raiders lack the resiliency to bounce back off those back-breaking mistakes. And if you're going to make those mistakes as Gardner Minshew is going to make, you know, you're not going to recover from those with that mentality at the quarterback position. So that's a great point by Anders on that call. Yeah. And we know, we know too, again, going back to what at least Antonio Pierce has told us about his, his mentality around how he wants his football team, how he wants his quarterback. I think when he got Gardner Minshew, he thought that's what he was getting. He was getting, yeah, the free spirit wants to be himself, which fits in perfectly with the Raiders, but he also figured he would get that fiery leader. That has not been him. Aiden O'Connell's not a fiery leader. He just needs to find a little bit of it. Uh, and so I, I anticipate that that's what we'll see. We'll see O'Connell go against the Steelers uh, down at Allegiant Stadium. So we'll see how it all runs up. But Anders, great call, man. As always, we appreciate you. And thank you for calling. And if you want to call in for the next show, 702-900-7869 is the number. You're in overtime here as we go through your phone calls. Next up is our good friend, NorCal Raider. Hey, guys. How's it going? This is uh, NorCal Raider. Just checking in. Uh, just kind of just weighing it on this weekend you know it was a tough watch you know um i i thought we were a little bit tougher than i expected people say um oh it was the players and whatever but it all comes from coaching um i don't know i don't know what to expect from this season anymore trying to trying to you know still have hope with what's going on but but with Devante, um if they trade him Let's trade him for a pick. We don't need a player. And um, the reason I'm explaining why is because we don't even know if this, if this head coach is going to come back and if they even, even fit the scheme to trade for another player. So let's just trade the pick and hopefully get a second round pick. Um, I don't know if there are any free agent quarterbacks out there. Um, <laughs> veterans, I mean, what's his name? Black Bulls are playing for the Colts, but um, it would be nice to have an extra quarterback. I don't know because I feel like we're going to be we're going to be um, shuffling Aiden and Garner all season, but but um, I felt like that just a little broken down with this week, this this past weekend. But um, looking forward to the podcast. Thanks. Our guy NorCal Raiders sounded down. I don't, I I understand yeah. why. Um. And maybe it's making him sick to his stomach because it sounded like he was in the bathroom. Uh. But but we'll we'll see. I mean. Look, I get it. I get what he's saying there too, which is, you know, just everything seems to be going wrong. And with the quarterback situation, remember, they invested in Gardner Minshew as that veteran free agent. He was a top two in the free agent class, really. Uh, and and so they went out and got him. They they did, quote unquote, a good job of going to get what was available to back up uh, the plan with a young quarterback that they drafted before in Aiden O'Connell. And um, it hasn't worked. It just hasn't worked so far. And so we'll have to see if O'Connell can come through. But there's no rescue at quarterback um, that I can see anywhere, Mo. So just seeing this through a fan lens, no Cal Raiders lens, I understand the, the I want to say the the down attitude here because yeah. here you are, you go into the season, and Tony Pierce is selling you on all of these things. I think Dominique also, also mentioned this, ill intent, violence, pain, and all this other stuff, aggression. Raiders haven't been aggressive. They don't go for it <laughs> on fourth and short very much. Now, they haven't been able to convert a lot of times, so maybe that's part of it. But it seems like all the things that you thought could go right for the Raiders have just gone the opposite direction. True. Devontae, a lot of fans fear that Devontae has it eventually acts, acts out. What is he doing now? He prefers to play elsewhere. The Gardner Minshew signing, a lot of people like his, as you said, like his mentality, free spirit, not good enough. And I said, you're not going to get the same Gardner Minshew you got in Indianapolis because he's not the same play call. He's not bringing Shane Steichen with him from Indianapolis to Las Vegas. You got Luke Getze. Mm-hmm. A lot of fans are worried about Luke Getze. We voiced our concerns about Luke Getze. You talked about the spacing. I also talked about the lack of consistency. Can't figure out the run game right now. Doesn't top, uh, doesn't target Brock Bowers enough outside of the first two games and last game. 
I think we're going to see a lot more inconsistencies there as the season goes on. So everything that could possibly go wrong, right, seems like it's going yeah. wrong with the season. So I can understand why Neil Carroll Raider feels the way he does. And as as I believe our friend Gary Harker says, we have our work cut out for us. I'm not complaining, right, because I get to do this and a lot of people wish they could do what I do. But I will say, Scott, when you look at the season and we're only five weeks in going to week six, and I said this on Bleacher Report Live that the Raiders are two and three, but they feel like an 0 and 5 team. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. With, with everything that's happened from the beginning of the season, getting punched in the gut by the Chargers to start the year, it just feels like this team doesn't have any direction. There are a lot of questions, not a lot of answers, not a lot, you know, a lot of stuff they have to figure out still. Do they have to make changes in the offseason? It just feels like this never ending cycle of, rebuild retool change this fire this guy bring in another it goes back to what we've been saying all along scott mark davis has to step aside and let someone else make the football decisions he is nowhere close to al davis al davis i understand his later years weren't great with the raiders right. the decisions that he made but no one could deny that al davis was a, a football mind an exceptional yes. football mind Mark Davis, in my opinion, I don't mean any disrespect by this because respect him for what he's doing with the football team, moving him, getting him into a nice stadium, Allegiant Stadium. I get all of that. But Mark Davis feels like a fan running a football team. Don't, well put. No disrespect to the fans that listen to us and, and no, support us. No. You don't want fans running a football team. You need a football mind. Now, there's some knowledgeable fans out there, but Mark Davis isn't one of them. He needs to step aside and have someone else – make these executive football decisions to get this football team back on track. Yeah. And if you remember not to pat myself on the back, but I will, uh, back when, when the coaching search started, I, I, I wrote a piece up on sports, not, I'll try to link it below saying that he needed to hire like a president of football operations, somebody who would be that he could trust and turn over the decision-making on hiring a GM, hiring coaches, all that stuff, because to your point, uh, Mark Davis is not Al Davis. He doesn't have the football acumen. Yeah, he grew up around the team, but he grew up around the team as a kid, as a fan. And then later on, yeah, he worked with the organization, but not the same. It's the reason why Al Davis expressed his concern, I think, in leaving the team to Mark Davis. And again, it's not disrespectful. I like Mark Davis. I've met him several times personally and talked to him. Good dude. But again, to the point, you need somebody who understands football in the modern age who can make decisions that are best for this team. That way you don't make bad decisions. Now, again, that's consistency. That's stability. Um, when you're too close to a situation, you're too close to players, you're too close to the coaches, you're going to make different decisions. So we'll see how it all nets out. Like you said, Mo, it's only week five. Do the Raiders have a chance to salvage, so to speak, the season? You said it feels like 0-5. I think that's because a lot of the off-the-field drama right and and when they get beat it's not like boy they're getting beat by a field goal on a really tough play uh on, on the last play of a game and it was a close one no they're getting beat handily and that's a different sign and and everybody wants to blame one person everybody wants to blame the coach only everybody wants to blame the gm everybody wants to blame the owner everybody wants, no it's all of them together there's multiple levels of failure at certain times with this organization so there's not one easy answer you don't fire one guy and everything's going to get better no, there's a lot of introspection that needs to happen. A lot needs to go on. So we'll see. But uh, NorCal Raider, hang in there, man. Hang in there. Hang yeah. in there. All right. Now, our last call is uh, our good friend T. Dougie out in Cali. Here we go. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mo. This is T. Dougie in California. I just saw the Christian Wilkin news about uh, his foot injury going on IR. And I just like to say that'll do it. <laughs> Time to pack it in. It doesn't sound great. I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but maybe this is a good thing. Um, you know, the Raiders have always been middle of the pack, and because of that, we haven't been able to get uh, that that quarterback. You know, in the top five, ten pick. So maybe this season will finally get us to where you know we need to go. It, and it sucks to say, but I mean, with with all the offensive issues, no run game, you know, the quarterback situation, Devontae leaving, at this point in time, you were relying on your defense to at least make the games close. But you saw against Denver, the moment Christian Wilkins left, the defense 
was even worse than it ever looked. And I, he was a big part of that interior push. So not having him along with all the other injuries to pile up, I mean, it's, it's going to get ugly. Um, and the, the schedule is going to start changing soon. And so for me, you know, that's about it. Uh, kind of looking forward to the draft, looking forward to the 2025 <laughs> season. Um, maybe look at some young guys stepping up the rest of the season, trying to see if, you know, Antonio Pierce can still get some inspired play football to at least, you know, be competitive so that he can uh, continue to keep his job. But, I mean, you, you need the talent around you. You can try to get the most out of your talent, but it's going to be difficult with all the injuries. So I uh, hope I'm wrong, but we'll see. Looks like it's, it's, it's done. So thanks, guys. Have a good one. There you go, T. Dougie. I think a lot of few people feel that way. Obviously, we heard uh, NorCal Raider before him, but again, it's early. I'm again, I'm not saying this team's going to go to the playoffs or go to the Super Bowl, but I wouldn't get so down yet. Yes, it looks bad, right? And he talked Mo about okay, maybe maybe the upside here is that the Raiders can finally get up in the draft and get a quarterback. But I want to point out, and I don't mean to pour on here because it's early. It's only five weeks in. But if you look at the draft order right now. Again, this will change. But you look at the draft order right now, the Raiders are 11th, okay, in the draft. So where does that put you? It doesn't put you in the great position. Now you could always move up, try to move up. But here's what I, I said this last year, Mo, and I want to bring it up again. Most valuable position in the NFL, quarterback. We all know that. That's why we're talking about it. If you look at the teams at the bottom of the league right now, Tennessee, Carolina, Jacksonville, okay, mate, they just gave money to their quarterback, so no, no dice there. The Rams, whose quarterback is aging. Cleveland, Deshaun Watson's a disaster. They're just going to have to move on. Cincinnati doesn't need a quarterback. And New England just took a quarterback. You look at, there's there's legitimately Mo, and then you can look at some of the other teams like Miami, depending what happens with, with Tua. You can look at even New Orleans, even though they gave Carr that money. Um, Indianapolis, who knows? You're looking at this the, the NFL right now, Mo, there's... There's four or five other teams legitimately who would want to be up there at the draft and get a quarterback as well. This is why I think Tom Telesco has to be aggressive regardless of what happens. Unless the Raiders get yeah. the number one overall pick or the number two overall or top three pick, you can't leave it to chance because even if those teams, let's say, win more games and they fall out of the top 10 and they're 12, yeah. what if they move up? What if they're more aggressive than the Raiders in getting a quarterback? So it, the attention, the focus should shift to Tom Telesco in the offseason. Mm -hmm. Unless, as I said, unless the Raiders are have a top three pick, he needs to be aggressive to get the guy that, that he wants or the guy that the team wants. Because if you leave it to chance and you miss out, there's no excuse for it at that right. point. Because then right. you'll have you had a bad season, what we think is going to be a bad season. You have this need at quarterback, obvious need, because neither of the two guys are the answer. The only way you're going to move forward is if you get that guy on the center. And if you don't get that guy on the center, we're only going to be repeating this cycle in 2025. So I'm I'm with T. Dougie here. I, not to say I've checked out, but I'm of the I'm of the thought that even though the Rays are two and three right now, they're not going to win many football games. I said it on Twitter. I said they're going to probably now win as many football games as I, as I can count on one hand. <laughs> So they're probably, in my opinion, winning at most maybe three more football games. Their schedule is going to get harder as the season goes on. The Rams are going to be healthy by the time they play them. The Bengals are on the schedule, and they're trying to make a run at the starting one and four. You get the Falcons are pretty good, and they found their offense. You saw that last Thursday. The Tampa Buccaneers are on, on the schedule as well. The Chiefs, mm -hmm. by the way, they haven't even played yet. So this schedule doesn't lighten up. It only gets tougher. So I'm just giving you the reality, people. I'm not going to say it's everything is going to be okay and pat you on the back. I'm going to be honest with you. This is a season where they're probably going to be outside of the Jeff Fisher zone. I think I talked about that with yes. our good friend Dave Casper, the ghost. The Rays have been this Jeff Fisher zone. I think T. Dougie brought that up, too. They've been mm -hmm. a middling football team, so they haven't had a top pick. Yeah. This is the year that they're probably going to win five games. They're going to have a top eight pick somewhere in there. Tom Telesco has to get it done and get the quarterback because there are no excuses at that point. There you go. Yeah, and that's that's the one thing I wanted to say, too, because I know, you know, we appreciate everybody tuning in and listening and watching. Uh, at the same time, we're not going to sugarcoat. Like, we're, we, we it would behoove us for the Raiders to do better. If the Raiders were winning and everything was good, 
it's very positive. We can talk about that. We can go into that. Um, when things aren't going good, we're not going to continue to tell you things are going good. There's a lot of folks out there who do that because they know you're going to read it and people want affirmation. We're going to give it to you like it is. And I know our audience more than most appreciate that. So thank you for that. But again, we're not going to just get down uh, down on you here and try to try to get negative about everything. But we're going to be realistic and uh, bring in some of the the positives that can come out of struggles because th there are. You have to always look at what can happen here. And and Mo just I think captured it well with what Tom Telesco is going to have to do with how the Raiders end up this season. Mo, before we check out of here for the day, of course we got the big weekend coming up. Let everybody know what you got coming up this weekend. Uh, not only on Bleacher Report, but elsewhere. So I'll go from being morbid mo to positive mo. So I, <laughs> I have the pros and cons of starting Aiden O'Connell up over on Sports Night that I released on Wednesday. So basically the negatives and the positives, because there are negatives, there are positives to start Aiden O'Connell. It's probably time as we're recording this on Wednesday. As Scott mentioned early in the show, I'll be on TNT True TV with my guy, Coy Wire, talking NFL topics. The biggest topics coming up for week six. I can't promise the Raiders will be a topic, but I could sneak a Raider topic in there as they play the Steelers. <laughs> as you know, the Steelers have a big following. There could be a lot of terrible tiles at Allegiant Stadium. So a lot to talk about with those two teams. Also, as usual, on Sunday, I will be on after the game. Win, lose, or tie. To break it down. <laughs> What the Raiders did, how are they looking? Do they get to 500? Does Aiden O'Connell, if he does start, look pretty good? Because if he does, that could add some some a bright outlook, a bit of a, yeah. a bright outlook for Raider fans like NorCal Raider who are down on the season. That at least we could see the development of Aiden O'Connell and Tyree Wilson and some of the young guys on both sides of the ball. Well, there you go. Yes, we didn't do a show on Tuesday, but we give you an hour and a half worth of content on this thursday so hopefully you got that also make sure you uh, catch up with murph and i after the game as well here on our live post game show brought to you again by our good friends at bet us it's the bet us post game show with murph and scott so make sure you check that out do us a favor make sure you subscribe wherever you get your audio your podcast uh, look for silver and black today don't forget to rate and review also if you're watching us on youtube or another video platform Make sure to like, subscribe, hit that notifications bell so you know whenever we have a new video. We'd appreciate that very much. Want to thank uh, my partner, Mo Moten. Also, our producer, Mr. Mike Robier at Odyssey for all his help in putting this show together. Thank you for that. Uh, for Mo Moten, I'm Scott Colbranson. We'll talk to you guys on Sunday afternoon. Take care now. All right. <laughs>